been asked to give kind of a primer on renewable natural gas. And I'm going to start this off with the governor uh, mentioned a project in uh, central Washington where they were going to uh, build digesters on a dairy farm and make renewable natural gas. The story behind that is that there is one existing digester there right now, and the, the new project will expand it and make more digesters. But that existing digester had a 15-year power purchase agreement for eight cents per kilowatt hour. And about two years ago, that 15-year contract was up for renewal. And the local energy supplier offered him three cents, as opposed to eight cents for renewal. Three cents doesn't even allow you to uh, cover your operating expenses, let alone try to pay off debt. Um, so. This story is sadly taking place across the entire United States. I have uh, industry partners that have told me similar stories in Michigan, Wisconsin, New York, um, all across the country, that we're just not going to get digesters built to make electricity as long as the states no longer have pressure to meet their renewable electrical portfolios and are only going to offer three, four cents per kilowatt hour. So your other choice, besides shutting them down and not building digesters, is to try to scrub the gas and make it a renewable natural fuel, either to put in the pipeline or put into uh, a fueling station. I'm going to talk a little bit about raw biogas and what you have to do to upgrade its standards, then talk about what we have to scrub out, and then kind of give the big picture about how we could get the industry to work. Uh, this is typical biogas from a manure digester, uh, maybe with some co-digestion. It's going to be 54 to 70 percent methane. Uh, sometimes when you have more dilute material or higher substrates, you'll see that methane percentage go up. But the key thing is that in with the methane, which is what you really want, is carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide. And yes, there's other uh, impurities, water vapor, uh, potentially hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. Um, but the bad thing to take from this is that it has hydrogen sulfide and it has carbon dioxide. And you need to get rid of those two um, to be able to get to your renewable natural gas. The good is that with dairy manure, you very rarely see uh, siloxanes which can be a real pain to try to scrub out. Um, although if you're going to do certain types of co-digestion, uh, with the previous talk, you better maybe watch your siloxanes. To be able to go from that raw biogas to putting it in the pipeline or putting it into direct vehicle use, you need to have greater than 75%. That's kind of a misnomer. I mean, you want to be at 98 99%. Um, I just put greater because some of the standards aren't real specific there. Um, you want your carbon dioxide very low. Your hydrogen sulfide has to be extremely low. Hydrogen, nothing. Oxygen, as close to nothing as possible. Um, so you really need to scrub almost everything out and get it to, to the pure methane. While there's lots of things that are possibly in the gas, I'm just going to talk real quickly about three. Water vapor, uh, like 8 to 10 percent of the raw biogas is water vapor, depending on the te temperature you're operating at. But fortunately, water vapor is pretty easy to get rid of. Uh, there's a variety of ways, but 99 percent of the industry just uses a chiller. Uh, you just take the raw biogas coming out of that hot digester, put it through a chiller to be able to bring the temperature down. When the temperature comes down, the water vapor condenses into a liquid and it just drips out. So pretty easy to get rid of water. Next one we need to remove is hydrogen sulfide. You want to remove hydrogen sulfide even if you're not going to make renewable natural gas, if you're still going to use electricity. You want to try to get rid of as much hydrogen sulfide because it's going to cause wear and tear on the engine. Also, you have air quality uh, regulations that might control your hydrogen sulfide or your uh, SOx emissions. So we have many different ways to be able to remove hydrogen sulfide, and I'm going to talk about them in the next slides. 
after you've gotten rid of hydrogen sulfide, you want to remove carbon dioxide, uh, and carbon dioxide is where you really want to remove with renewable natural gas. You don't really need to, to remove it for uh, electrical pur purposes. Hydrogen sulfide. First way that many people do hydrogen sulfide is they try to remove it inside the digester vessel through a biological system. And basically all you do is you pump in a small amount, like two, three percent of air or oxygen into the headspace of the digester. By giving a little bit of that oxygen into the headspace, you're still maintaining a relatively anaerobic environment, which you need to be able to do the digestion but you're giving just enough oxygen to grow aerobic bacteria that can convert hydrogen sulfide to elemental sulfur at the liquid uh, gas interface. And sometimes people will add nets and some kind of you know, other structure to be able to grow or keep those microorganisms that are converting the sulfur there. Um, but eventually the sulfur just works its way into elemental sulfur, grows on the sides of the wall of the digester, eventually goes into the liquid and goes into the lagoon. I've actually gone into some digesters that have been opened up because of some clean out or decommissioning and you can see stalactites of uh, sulfur that have formed because of this biological operation inside the digester. It does a pretty good job of reducing it, um, but not completely. Um, so it's not the best technique for getting to uh, renewable natural gas. It just helps with the engines. You can do the exact same thing outside of the vessel. You're just going to do it more efficiently. You can do a physiochemical way. Uh, you've probably heard of iron scrubs, iron sponges, activated carbon. These are just uh, physical or chemical media that can latch onto the hydrogen sulfide and clean the biogas. And water scrubber is one way, but water scrubber also cleans out the uh, carbon dioxide, which I'll talk about here. There's many different ways to remove the carbon dioxide. I'm just going to talk about the three most common. First one is a water scrubber. Uh, that's an example of one at the Fair Oaks Dairy in Indiana. Uh, water scrubber works by the principle that if you increase the temperature and pressure, you can take advantage of the solubility of hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide going into solution while methane doesn't. So since the methane doesn't go into solution, it just goes straight to where you want it. Your impurities are in the water. You can do a regenerative step to lower the temperature and pressure, and then it leaves the water, and you just keep recycling that water. Problems are capital costs, operating costs, high electricity, cost money. Second way is a pressure swing absorption. Does this same method of trying to take the impurities and put it one place, methane the other place, uh, has a regenerative step, but previously with water it was using solubilities. Pressure swing uses affinities to different chemicals. Third one is membranes. Same principle again. Shove impurities one direction, methane the other doesn't work on solubilities, doesn't work on affinity, works on ability to go through a membrane or not. But they have problems with fouling and uh, contamination leading to problems. Right now, the most common one is water scrubbers on dairies. But here's the main part I wanted to talk about. If we are going to transition from farm-based digesters being electrical to renewable natural gas, we need to answer these questions. One, will the historic decoupling of diesel and natural gas continue? Some people will say yes, some people will say no. If yes, RNG can ride the CNG wave. Number two, will CNG continue to expand, allowing for much more needed development and fueling? So if the CNG wave is, it gonna, is going to occur, and we can ride that wave. One of the things that we're riding on that wave is that you've got all the fueling stations across the country, you've got all the uh, trucks that are being converted to CNG trucks. The biogas industry doesn't have to deal with that. The CNG industry is getting all that stuff done. We're just going to ride that. Three, 
can R and G compete with C and G? So the first two are saying, let's ride the C and G wave. The third one's saying, well, if you're going to ride the C and G wave, you better be able to compete against C and G. Well, the way you compete against C and G is the federal government. Is the federal government going to give you renewable fuel standards, RINs, LCFAs, uh, uh, low carbon fuel standard uh, benefits to be able to compete? That's a question that's out there. <laughs> Will the federal government keep to it? Will they stand by it for the extended period of time? Can the cost of biogas purification be brought down? Right now, biogas purification is about a dollar to two dollars per MMBTU. You know, if, if you're at two, say, right now, if you could cut that in half to a dollar, that dollar that you cut is now a dollar of profit. So can we decrease the cost? Can we access pipe, gas pipelines? Previous presentation said there are blockages to entering the gas pipeline. Historically, electrical systems have had a problem because the power companies haven't wanted to play fair. We're just changing the people who don't want to play fair. <laughs> We're going to the pipeline people who you're going to have to talk into playing fair. Um, eco credits. There are some states that are going to take the, the added benefit of not just watching the federal government, California, Oregon, Washington, with the low carbon fuel standard. Imagine if you can stack those. Not only get a dollar, dollar fifty for RINs, but get another fifty cents for LCFA. So states are going to play a role here. Um, to maximize RNG production, you're going to want to do co digestion. But if you're going to want to do co, -co digestion, then you're going to have to deal with the problems of co digestion. <laughs> Those are the questions that you're going to want answered to see if we can develop as a nation an RNG industry. Those two references are great references if you want some further reading material because I just took you know, a synopsis for you guys. Uh, they go into much more detail about the technologies. And thank you for your time. I'll leave it on there if you're ready. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll give you an example of this project in Washington I've been working with. Um, the scrubber that they're buying, it happens to be a water scrubber. I'm not, you know, you can pick any kind of system you want. But this water scrubber they're buying, uh, they want to maximize to the highest level of scrubber because you get the best cost efficiencies and power curves. And that's a, that largest one is a 1,800 uh, standard cubic feet per minute scale. Um, so they're immediately figuring out, okay, where are my manures? Where are my co-digestion substrates that get me to 1,800? <laughs> and do those two meet the RFs, RFS rules? And yeah, they're at, um, this, right now they're at like 17% below that, that threshold. But just gives you an idea that these project developers are thinking exactly like that. They start way up here, how can I make the most amount of money? make the most amount of RNG? How can I make the most amount of RNG the most efficiently? Use the most efficient scrubber. Well, what scale is that scrubber at? Okay, if that's the scale, how many cows do I need? Is that enough? No, it's not enough. So how much substrate do I need? <laughs> do the substrate fit with the rules? Okay, now I got those. Can I then make it work? <laughs> that, that's your project development.
We have very few uh, RNG projects across the country. There's one in Colorado. There's one here in Washington we're trying to do. There's some in California going. The Indiana one does not go into the pipeline. It goes directly to a fueling station. Um, you're going to see some go directly to the fueling, fueling station because there's maybe superior economics there at play. And second, uh, you don't have to deal with the gas line. Um, but we're not going to be able to do across the country at the scale we want to do, be able to do all direct to fueling. We're going to have to work with the pipeline people. And my understanding is that sometimes you talk to the pipeline people, they don't even want to give you the time of day. Some will talk to you. It's just like the power companies. Um, I'll give you an example here in Washington. They wanted to charge over $1 million just to tap into the pipeline. One million dollar cost to just tap in, let alone you need to develop the spurs to go from the dairy to the actual pipeline. Um, and in this project, the, the, they're doing the spurs because of REAP dollars, EQIP dollars, federal, state, private partnerships. That's going to have to happen. It, it's, what's just ironic is we're seeing the same thing when it was electrical. We talked about the companies and we talked about the exorbitant. Uh, interconnect fees. It's all happening over again, just different way. A big, uh, I had that a big issue again as we continue to think RNG development should be sort of a boutique private sector deal, and all of our conventional utilities we see as public infrastructure, and economics are totally different. And even with conventional electric generation conventional natural gas, it's still in public infrastructure terms. So I think like right away acquisition is totally different. Mm -hmm. See what I appreciate the comment. Okay. Uh, and just because you're in Washington State, I also might mention there are some interesting boutique things. You know, Washington State has a huge ferry system. You know, what better fuel to run your ferry systems off of? So each state is going to have some of their own unique things.